Okay, good morning, Chem 122 students. Um, today, I'm going to create uh, experiment number 23, which is the determination of iron by redox titration. Now, in this experiment, we're going to do two different titrations. First, we're going to take a standard amount of sodium oxalate and titrate it with potassium permanganate. Uh, and this is going to be used to find the concentration of permanganate. And then we're going to use that concentration of permanganate to find out the amount of iron in an unknown sample. Um, so we're going to do two different titrations, and each titration is going to be done duplicate uh, for a total of four um, titrations total. Now, redox titrations involve um, transfers of oxygen. I'm sorry, transfers of electrons. And in this um, first standardization reaction, uh, we're taking permanganate ion and reacting with oxalate ion to produce manganese 2 and carbon dioxide. So in the reaction, the manganese is undergoing an oxidation number change from plus 7 to plus 2. So that manganese, since it's gaining electrons, is undergoing a reduction. Now, this is undergoing a reduction, but we call it an oxidizing agent or an oxidant. Okay. So always remember that whatever species is undergoing, you know, the reduction process is itself, you know, classified as the oxidant. Now, the oxalate ion is undergoing and oxidation. So this is being oxidized as it goes to form carbon dioxide. Okay, And so we would classify the oxalate ion as the reductant in this reaction. Okay, So I'm going to step through um, the process involved in balancing a redox uh, reaction. And then we're going to look at you know, some of the experimental details uh, and I'll talk about the calculations before we actually go and, and do the um, do the experiment. Okay, so let's um, just take a, a reaction, and this is not the one that you're doing uh, in the experiment. In fact, the one you're doing in the experiment is already balanced for you. Okay, but I just want to show you this process of balancing a redox reaction. And we use a technique called the half reaction method. And so in this half reaction method, we're going to look at the oxidation part of the reaction separately from the reduction part of the reaction, and then we're going to kind of match those up in terms of electrons. All right, so let's take a look at this reaction. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to figure out the oxidation number of all of the atoms that are involved in this reaction. So if we look at the very first reactant here, this is called the dichromate ion. We can figure out the oxidation number of the chromium because Oxygen normally has an oxidation number of minus 2. So if we think the sum of the oxidation numbers has to equal the charge on the ion. So whatever the oxidation number of chromium is, uh, when we add it to 7 oxide ions, which each have an oxidation number of negative 2, we're going to get the charge on that polyatomic ion, which is minus 2. Uh, so solving for the oxidation number of chromium, it starts out as plus six, okay? So this chromium in this reaction is being reduced from the plus six oxidation state to plus three, okay? So in the product side, all right, um, we list chromium as just a monoatomic ion, and you know, for a monoatomic ion, the oxidation number is the same as its charge, right? Now, um, here we have another monoatomic ion, the chloride ion. Okay, so that has an oxidation number of negative one. And uh, chlorine has an oxidation number of zero because it's the element in its elemental form. Okay, so let's first, let's first take a look at the reduction process. All right, so we're going to write Cr2O7, 2 minus on the reactant side. And on the product side, we're going to write Cr3 plus. Okay. To balance this equation, the first thing I'm going to do is balance the metal, all right? So I can do that by putting a coefficient of 2 in front of the chromium 3 plus, all right? The next thing I want to do is I want to balance the oxygen. 
And so we normally do that with water. Um, so I've got seven oxygen atoms on the reactant side of the reaction. So we're going to put seven H2O molecules on the product side. Okay. And now we want to balance the hydrogens, right? This is in acidic solution. So to balance the seven H2s, I'm going to put 14 H plus on the reactant side. Okay. Now, the last thing we need to do is balance out the charges. Okay. There's a couple of ways to do that. Um, one of the ways is to look at that oxidation number change. Okay. So remember, each chromium underwent a three electron reduction. And we have two chromiums. So that means we need to add six electrons. Okay. To the reactant side. Now the equation is balanced. Okay. One of the things that's important, whenever we balance an equation, uh, we have to have not only the atoms balance, um, but we need to uh, balance the um, uh, charges. Okay. So if we look at the reactant side, we've got a positive 14 here, a negative two, and a negative six. So that gives us a net of plus six. Okay. And on the um, react, I'm sorry, the product side, uh, we also have a, a a positive six, okay? So that's the reduction half of the reaction. Now let's take a look at the oxidation half, right? So we start with chloride ion uh, forming chlorine. Uh, so the first thing we have to do is we have to balance the atoms themselves. So I'm gonna put a two as a coefficient in front of the chloride ion. And now to balance out the charges, I'm gonna add two electrons, okay? So this is the um, you know, balanced oxidation part of the reaction. Now, to balance the overall reaction, we have to match up the number of electrons, okay? So we're going to multiply the oxidation half reaction by three, and then we're going to add it to the reduction reaction to get our overall reaction. So the overall reaction is going to look like this, 14H plus a Cr2O7 to minus... Uh, plus, we have to multiply this by three, so that's six chloride ions. And we're going to produce uh, two chromium three plus ions, uh, plus three chlorine molecules, uh, plus seven H2O molecules. Okay, we want to write this with the phase labels. Uh, if we can do that. Put AQ uh, beside everything except for. Um, you know, the water molecules. Okay, so this represents the balanced net ion equation here. Okay, let's go ahead and talk about the actual experiment we're doing today. We're using a technique um, called the titration, all right? And in all four of the titrations, um, we're going to utilize uh, potassium permanganate as our titrant. Now, potassium permanganate is actually a really intensely purple solution, okay? Um, so it's not only going to act as our titrant, but it's also going to be the indicator of the reaction. So once the reaction is completed, okay, uh, any bit of excess permanganate is going to show up as a pink color in the solution, right? And um, the titration in appearance is going to look a bit like the titrations that we did with, um, you know, acids being titrated with bases and using a phenothalene indicator. It's going to be looking for like a faint a pink endpoint, right? Um, so we're going to use a burette to measure our titration volume. And this is the apparatus here on the left, okay, that we're going to use, right? Uh, one of the things about reading burettes is that we read exactly the measurement we see, okay? So we're going to start off with almost a full burette. So when we start our titration, our initial volume is actually close to zero mils, right? And then we're going to discharge the titrant into our uh, reaction flax as we perform the titration, all right? Now, normally when we're reading burettes, we usually read from the bottom of the meniscus, okay, and see where it lines up. And with these particular burettes, you know, they've got big markings every uh, milliliter. 
and they've got smaller markings every tenth of a milliliter. Okay, so in principle, if it's a nice clear solution, uh, you may be able to make a measurement to the hundredth of a mil. Okay, with this solution, since the color is so intense, and we're going to be looking at it through a video, um, you'll probably be able to measure to the tenth of a mil. Okay. The other thing the instructions tell us to do with the permanganate is we're going to read from the top of the meniscus. Okay, so um, don't try to like see where the bottom is. Just read from the top of the meniscus. Okay, and then be consistent. So if you read from the top of the meniscus on the initial burette reading, you're going to read from the top of the meniscus on the final burette reading as well. Okay, um, so let me talk a little bit about the experiment that I'm going to perform. Okay, um, the first thing I'm going to do is prepare, prepare a sodium oxalate um, standard solution. Okay, the so sodium oxalate is a white solid. Okay, it's Na2Cl2, C2O4, right? What I'm going to do is I'm just going to measure a mass out like close to a gram, okay? And I'm going to transfer that mass to a volumetric flask. Okay, so volumetric flasks look something like this, all right? And then once we transfer that mass into the volumetric flask, I'm going to add a little bit of sulfuric acid, a little bit of water, and I'm going to warm it up because it takes a while for um, this stuff to dissolve, okay? Now, when I actually film the experiment, I'm going to show you the mass measurement in sodium oxalate, but I'm not going to show you the whole process of making up the solution because it takes a long time, all right? Uh, but ultimately, after we uh, make our solution, the final volume is going to be 100 mLs. Let's just say 100.0 mLs. Okay. Now, when we do the titration, okay, we're going to take a 20 mL portion of this. So we'll remove 20.00 mLs. We're going to use a uh, volumetric pipette to do so. And you're going to go ahead and use that 20 mils um, later when you do your calculation. Okay, so we're going to put that into the Erlenmeyer flask. Um, and then we're going to, um, actually, we have to add a little water, a little sulfuric acid. We actually have to heat that as well because this reaction occurs pretty slowly. So this solution, I'm going to heat to, I don't know, about 70, 75 degrees uh, Celsius. And then we're going to go ahead uh, and do that titration. Okay, so let's um, kind of go through the calculations. So from the mass of the sodium oxalate, we're going to use the molar mass of that sodium oxalate um, to find out how many moles of sodium oxalate are present. And in this particular solution, uh, we end up dissolving it into 100 mils, right? And so ultimately what we can come up with is the molarity by taking, you know, the moles of sodium oxalate and dividing it by the volume. Remember, when you're doing these calculations, you're going to convert this to liters. So we'll get the molarity of sodium oxalate. All right. Now, when we do redox titrations, um, a lot of times it's convenient for us uh, to think in terms of moles of electron transferred, all right? So if you remember that oxalate ion was undergoing a two electron oxidation to form carbon dioxide. So we're gonna take this molarity of the sodium oxalate, okay? And we're gonna multiply it by two because there's two electrons, and that's going to give us the normality of sodium oxalate, right? So um, the potassium uh, permanganate came in a four solution. We're going to, you know, um, use this titration to calculate that, that normality. So the equation we're going to end up using is the normality of the KMnO4 times the volume of the KMnO4 
and we're going to measure that from our titration, right? So if you remember, we had the um, final volume minus the initial volume. And this is going to give us our volume of titrant. Okay. And in this calculation, um, it's okay for us to do the calculation in milli equivalents. Um, so if you want to just leave that in mils, um, that's fine. Just remember to also express the volume uh, of the of the um, of the oxalate in mils as well. So the uh, normality of the sodium oxalate is something that we're going to calculate, which I just uh, outlined above. Okay. And the volume of the sodium oxalate is that 20.00 mLs. Okay, so we're going to do both of our titrations. We're going to calculate the normality of uh, potassium uh, permanganate. Okay, and then we're going to use the average of those um, normalities, right? Um, before we analyze the iron sample. No. Um, According to the instructions, you have to be within 2%. Okay, so hopefully I will get within 2%. Otherwise, you guys are out of luck, all right? Um, so we'll do that uh, titration, okay? We're going to do this titration in duplicate, and we'll get, you know, a couple normalities. We'll average those. Now, the iron um, determination is a little bit different, okay? So for the iron, we're going to take our unknown A sample, I'm going to measure a mass and put that mass directly into an Erlenmeyer flask. So we're going to measure the mass on the analytical balance in grams. And we're going to do the, you know, the same titration. Okay, so for the iron, the titration proceeds uh, more rapidly, um, so we don't need to heat the solution. Okay. So once we measure this iron sample, we're going to put it into a uh, Erlenmeyer flask. All right. And we're also going to put a little bit of uh, phosphoric acid, a little bit of sulfuric acid, a little bit of water in there as well. All right. And then we're going to do the exact same titration that we did with the um, oxalate. We're going to be looking for that first um, permanent pink color to develop. So um, in this case, okay, uh, we don't really know what the iron is, right? So we're going to start our calculations with the permanganate, okay? So we determined the normality of the KMnO4 in the standardization part. And they're going to multiply that by the volume of the KMnO4. And for this type of calculation, you're better off doing the volume in liters. Okay. Um, so that's going to give us equivalence. of KMnO4. Now, with the iron process, iron is being oxidized from Fe2 plus to Fe3 plus. So it's only undergoing a one electron oxidation. So what that means is that when the um, titration volume is, volume is hit, when we're completed with our titration, the equivalents of KMnO4 are going to be equal to the equivalents of iron ion. And since it's only a one electron um, oxidation that iron 2 is going to undergo, that's going to also be the same as the moles of iron. Okay. Now, once we get the moles of iron, going to multiply it by the molar mass, okay, and that will give us the mass of iron. And in the end, we'll take the mass of iron and, of course, divide it by the unknown mass, multiply that by 100% uh, to get the percentage of iron. Okay, 
So that's the experiment in a nutshell. I'm going to go ahead and demonstrate that. All right. So uh, first step is to filter our potassium permanganate solution. Uh, so I'm going to pour the solution through some uh, glass wool and collect it in this um, round bottom flask. Uh, for the whole experiment, I'll probably need about a couple hundred mils. Yeah, that should be plenty. Okay, so I'm going to fill the burette with the potassium permanganate. And maybe I put a little too much in there. Uh, so I'm going to let a little bit of this run out. And normally when we do titrations, we uh, measure to the bottom of the meniscus, but since this liquid is so deeply purple, we're going to measure uh, from the top of the meniscus. So, you got the. Hold on, I need something to put behind it. Something white like this. Yeah. Standardize the potassium uh, permanganate, where you use sodium oxalate. Um, so I've measured out a quantity of sodium oxalate, which you can see, and then we're going to put this sodium oxalate into a volumetric uh, flask. So we're going to add some sulfuric acid, a little bit of water, heat it up to get this all into solution, and that's going to be the standard that we're going to use for our titrations. Okay, so this is the first standard that I'm going to prep for the titration. Um, so I'm going to take 20 mils of sodium oxalate and use a volumetric pipette. And transfer it to my flask. I'm going to have 50 mils of water and 20 mils of 3 molar sulfuric acid. And we're going to heat it on the hot plate until it's between 70 and 80 degrees Celsius. So that'll take a few minutes. My oxalate solution is hot enough to titrate now. And the directions say to titrate the first 5 to 10 mils very rapidly. Um, so we'll do that. And you see a deep purple color? Well, as we swirl it goes away. Um, so now I'm going to continue titrating. And I'm going to go rapidly until this pink color uh, starts taking a longer period of time uh, you know, to diminish. And then I'll go you know, maybe drop away. Point. And it points when it stays pink for the 30 seconds. Let's just go ahead and measure the Okay, so this is the burette reading for our second standardization titration. So this is your initial um, volume that you record. So the sodium oxalate solution is about 75 degrees, so it's ready to titrate. 
Okay, we're going to do the first five to ten mils very fast. We know the last one was, you know, somewhere in the 30s. So pretty rapidly to about the same point. So the end point's when it stays pink for 30 seconds. We fit it. Take the reading now. All right, now we're going to weigh out our first unknown iron sample. This is sample A. It's supposed to be between 0.5 and 0.7 grams. So that is your sample number one. Record your mass. Make sure you tear the balance. And now we'll get our second sample of unknown A. And record your mass. Okay, so uh, we're going to titrate sample one. Uh, so the prep for this is pretty easy. Uh, we just have to transfer our sample quantitatively into an Erlenmeyer flask. Um, add 20 mils of water. About 10 mils of sulfuric acid. And about three mils of phosphoric acid. And no heat's required. Now all the iron isn't dissolved, but it will dissolve as we uh, do the titration. Uh, again, we're going to do the first five, ten mils really rapidly, and then we'll slow it down. Okay, that looks pink and it stayed that way for 30 seconds. So let's read the burette now. So this is our initial burette reading for the second iron sample. Okay, let's start the titration rapidly. Okay, so let's go ahead and read the final um, direct reading. 